Hello and welcome to Village Podcast. I'm Morgan C. Jones. I'm mad as old hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. This is the Village Podcast from Village Magazine. This is the editor of Village, Michael Smith. We'll be Mm -hmm. talking to Michael shortly. Each week, month, year, we're going to be discussing the issues that affect all of us here in Ireland as pertaining to political corruption, accountability and indeed softer issues like culture. Um, Michael, would you mind telling us a little bit about um, about Village Magazine, about the ethos, where, where it's coming from? Village is a uh, mainly a political magazine, but also deals with culture and um, the environment and media. Um, it was set up um, by Vincent Brown, well-known uh, man around town uh, journalist in um, 2004. And uh, after a lot of um, ups and downs, it fell into my lap in, um, a few years later, in around 2008, so I've been editing it uh, since then. Very small operation. Um, it's sort of ideological. It's uh, driven by, I suppose, three precepts. The first is um, equality, and that's equality of outcome, or sort of a radical view of equality, that basically there should be redistribution of resources so everybody can participate equally um, in the good Um, and then um, I suppose I see as an an offshoot of equality is uh, is environmentalism ensuring that the next generation has the same stake in the environment uh, and in the fruits of the earth as as we've been lucky enough to have ourselves so sustainability would be the the second and then the final one is um, accountability which I suppose drives a lot um, so I, I would say that we are left wing. We also have a big um, environmental orientation. Um, we're very fact driven, though, as well as being ideological. We would always say facts first and then apply the ideology, not the other way around. I think a lot of media, maybe if they're, uh, you know, if they are ideological, they tend to let the ideologi- ideology get in the way of ascertaining what the relevant facts are. We try not to do that, and we're also not preachy or uh, inclined to rant. We're very fact driven, quite dry. I like to think. I think I, I bring. A certain uh, um, off-putting dryness to... Uh, no, I did. Right. So you walked past a puddle in the lane where it just disappeared as yes. you walked by, yeah. But, um, so we try to come out uh, as often as possible due to um, lack of energy and finance. We, uh, anyway, for the next year we aim to come out um, eight times. We are ambitious, the thing is expanding. This is, this, uh, is an exciting part of that um, expansion. There's, there's good momentum. Um, but I, I suppose we specialise in, one thing we do uh, specialise in is whistleblowers. Uh, and there's a big niche for that, that a lot of people get, are frustrated that they can't get their stories across in, uh, in other media. Um, if you go to the Irish Times or RTE uh, with a hot story, quite often you find that once it's come through the bureaucracy, either it's not broadcast or published or else the guts of it are eviscerated. And that can be very frustrating for people. And that's probably why I got involved. I was, I was uh, chairman of Antashka and it was very difficult to get environmental stories across. So we do specialise in a sort of, it's an unusual thing, we specialise in partnerships with, um, with uh, whistleblowers or with informants. They come to us and we say, well, listen, tell the story on your own terms. Um, be, we'll do this as a, 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 as a partnership. You have a veto over it. If you don't like um, you know, the, the end story, you can just pull the plug in it and we won't, um, we won't print it at all. Um, obviously it has to be fair and it has to avoid defamation but it's just that people are allowed to phrase things the way they want and emphasise things the way uh, they want and we then work on making sure that we, uh, a speciality is, a, you know, in, in Village if you're a liar, I think to be honest nearly all the other media if you're a liar they make an effort not to uh, say that. Yeah. Whereas in Village this is great if somebody comes to me and they've got a sustainable case that somebody's telling lies or or is a liar that's great it's you know that's a great thing to 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 nail people if they are genuine delinquent same with if somebody's a racist you know once we've shown it to our satisfaction obviously the standard has to be quite high we're happy to say it it's not something that we would avoid um so yeah whistleblower so as a result of that whistleblower partnership thing we've we've 
we've done a few stories, most of which I would say I'm frustrated that they haven't uh, entered the um, public domain on the scale they should have. And in fact, we're going to talk to a couple of people who are behind some of those stories yeah. um, late, later today. But I suppose a couple that we have done that have um, ignited, well, the, the, the most famous one, I suppose, is the um, the story about uh, Leo Varadkar and the, the leak. And we'll be talking to Che Bose, who is actually the, I know he doesn't like the term uh, whistleblower, but um, he was the source of that story. A lot of whistleblowers actually finish up um, destroyed or, or getting a very hard time. Characteristically, the biggest whistleblowers um, you know, g get into deep water. A lot of them find they can't get work elsewhere. Just to cut yeah, in, sure, that, yeah, yeah. given your background or the magazine's background in partnering with whistleblowers, mm. does that expose the magazine and you <clears throat> and the staff to uh, the, the weight of it if if somebody having the finger pointed at them, being told, sorry, the emperor has no clothes, mm. uh, and you can prove that he's walking around bollock naked, mm -hmm. Notwithstanding all of that, mm. partnering with whistleblowers, does that leave you very exposed? Yeah, I think, I mean, um, I'm a, a lawyer by training, so this is, uh, I was never going to make a career at it, but this is a why I can justify it is that I, I do have a good sense of what you can say. Um, so again, unlike a lot of media, we'd be looking to work out what you can say, not what you can't say. And that's quite powerful if you're doing it in partnership mm. with um, with somebody who's got a big story to tell. I mean, I think we do publish a lot of stuff that um, that um, a lot of people would say is um, is defamatory. But um, if it's true, I'm generally um, inclined to um, think that we that we would you know, get away with it if it ever came to a defamation action. We get lots of de defamatory letters about defamation. A lot of legal letters we've never had to pay out on a defamation action. We got a lot of actions, um, but I think maybe there's a sense out there that we fight them or that we're careful. So we maybe get fewer now than we did before. Um, but um, there's a lot of threats. If you go through the uh, the Irish Times, most of the time they acknowledge village's existence. It's to to state that village has received a writ. And actually, it's quite often, characteristically, um, people um, who report in the Irish Times as suing village don't actually pursue it. They just um, there's a, a thing where you uh, you lodge the uh, your um, proceedings in the uh, in, in the High Court tip off the Irish Times that you've done that and never serve it on the, 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 the person who you're claiming has defamed you, so nothing further materialises. So there's a lot of defamation action that I've been advised of just because the Irish Times has told me, but I've never seen any further but, uh, evidence. it's actually just a complete paper tiger. It's well, it, it, that's the symptoms of it. I mean, we were... We were um, yeah, that's happened on, on several occasions. Yeah. But that's just, that, that's, that's, that's just like using a newspaper to say, you know, I'll see you in court. Well, I think defamation is um, is often used as a weapon. I don't want to say that about anyone in particular that um, has sued well, us. Well, you better not, because I'll sue. Um, or they claimed they would, anyway. But, um, yeah, I mean, we've got a load of actions that are... Uh, we, if I had the energy, I'd go into court and try and get them struck out. We've an action from Gemma Doherty that was never going to go anywhere after we called her a racist, which was one of the easiest uh, things to do. We've an action from the, uh, the former county manager in Donegal after we published um, serious allegations about him from, his, from the uh, former head planner in Donegal. Leo Varadkar, um, under cover of... Uh, all privilege said that um, the article we published about him was defamatory, uh, grossly defamatory. But he didn't um, he didn't say he was going to pursue it. But he certainly hasn't pursued it. In the last week, the Irish Times reported that the um, deputy chairman of um, of Bor Planola says that the complaint that I lodged in an article that written that was written in Village about him is um, is defamatory. But again. Um, I wasn't hanging around over the bank holiday um, waiting for the writs to arrive because they usually don't. So you don't have a bag, like <laughs> the way an expectant mother has a bag packed for the maternity hospital, you don't have a prison bag constantly packed. For the, uh, well, yeah, 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 the gear for the, the suit for the, um, for the high court. <laughs> no, this is it. Um, but it, 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 it is a factor. I mean, I, I think that um, if you talk about defamation, that um, you know, a characteristic thing was that um, Dennis O'Brien sued because I think the the Mail reported that he wasn't philanthropic, um, and he won the case. And a lot of people in the media say this is, you know, Dennis O'Brien is. Um, you know, he, he, he's a terrible force against free speech and that this was closing down the media. But 
there are a lot of things you can say about Dennis O'Brien that are true, like arguably yeah. <laughs> that he's corrupt. <laughs> but you can't say he's not a philanthropist because it happens to be the case. Dennis O'Brien goes down the street and he's shelling out fivers to people, who, to retainers who are coming up to him asking for money. He's a very famously, you know, I, I, I've heard he's famously um, generous and he's generous to charities. So it just happened to be wrong. So that, that was just not a good case on grounds of the simple lack of truth of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the allegation. Um, so journalists go around, there's a lot of media that will never mention Dennis O'Brien because they think that, you know, oh, oh, he'll sue. Well, he'll sue if you call, the, call him, a, uh, you know, if you say that he's not a philanthropist. But if you say something more central to his operations, like that maybe he's uh, characteristically involved in dodgy um, business practices, you get away with it. That's mm. why I'm saying it. Or, or that he won the whole country in an earthquake. <laughs> um, and for those of you listening or watching at home who don't uh, recognise that name, Dennis O'Brien, you probably know it better as beep, beep. Except here. Yes, because he's not redacted. There's nothing redacted here. We're going to be talking about that um, board plan of the story later. A little bit, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're, yeah, mostly uh, we've brought in whistleblowers. Um, maybe we'll do less dry, dry stuff in future. Yeah. But they're big stories that we've accumulated, and I know the um, whistleblowers are keen to, um, to get stuck in. Today. Yeah, we've got so many whistleblowers on this one, it's like watching one of those panpipe bands that visit and stand in markets. Yeah, the technical name for me is not, not so much editor as whistleblowee. Whistleblowee.